Well, good afternoon uh, from Budapest. Let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Zsolt Jamnitsky. I'm director of the Hungarian Business Leaders Forum, and I will be hosting and leading the panel through today's discussion on sustainable development, which I hope will be very interesting uh, for you as audience, uh, listeners, and viewers. Um, and I say it will be interesting because uh, I'm honored to host it with a very distinguished panel, um, which is very diverse and with a very great experience um, in many aspects of uh, sustainable investment. Uh, and I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce the panel members, Dora Fazekas, head of the Cambridge Econometrics Budapest office, Michael Birch, BlackRock, he's the managing director of BlackRock's Budapest office, the world's largest investment firm subsidiary. Um, Nandor Cepregi, who is director of the Blue Planet Climate Protection Foundation, a Hungarian foundation, which was founded by the president of the Republic of uh, Hungary two years ago, actually three in 2017. Uh, and we have great panel members from the corporate sector, namely Ada Pogain, head of business sustainability at Syngenta, Peter Nosek, CEO of the local subsidiary of Nestle, and last but not least, Peter Slavik, who is the corporate affairs director of Philip Morris um, in Hungary. Um, now, let me set the scene in a, in a few words before I give the floor over to the panelists. Um, sustainable investment is about investing in progress, generating added value to society at large, and of course, integrating the environmental, social, and governance criteria into the business or investment decisions, and of course, supporting the implementation of the sustainable development goals. Sustainable investment is nothing new. It was not brought about by COVID, but definitely the world, which has just changed recently in this year, uh, and we can say that we are leaving business as usual behind, it will have an even bigger impact and an even bigger um, emphasis um, on making the world a different and making it more sustainable. Today, my proposal would be to tackle the topic via a bottom-up approach, starting the discussion off with looking into the risks, how we can measure them, then taking it to the next level, to the investment side, to the investor side, and lastly, moving into showing some of the good and best corporate experiences that these worldwide companies can bring us uh, uh, to the table uh, and of course uh, having also some Hungarian uh, examples. So starting by looking at the uh, numbers, how we quantify, how we measure the climate related risks, of course financial risks, Cambridge Econometrics is actually very renowned to be the world leader in making these kinds of quantifications. And of course, uh, I'm also asking Dora to tell a few words about how she defines or how Cambridge defines sustainable investment. Dora, floor is yours. Thank you. So very happy to be here and be able to start the discussion. Uh, thank you. Um, and thanks for the introduction as well, also to the topic and uh, to the company. So Cambridge Econometrics is a, an economic research consultancy based in, um, headquartered in Cambridge, and we have an office in Brussels and Budapest. Um, I'm leading the office in Budapest and have been working in climate and energy policy for um, since I graduated. Um, so what is sustainable investment and why do we need to be talking about this is, is um, where I wanted to start the discussion. So we are already beginning to see the effects of climate change, rising temperatures and more extreme weather events. 
And although governments have agreed to mitigate the impacts of climate change by transitioning to a low carbon economy, but uh, to be honest, the current climate change commitments from countries, the so-called NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, are not ambitious enough. Um, they are estimated to correspond to roughly uh, 3.2 degrees of uh, warming increase, temperature increase compared to the pre-industrial levels. So definitely very significant changes are needed in, in government policy and in investment and behavior to be able to change the trajectory of these cumulative carbon emissions. And in whichever way those changes come about, or if they do not, but there are likely to be very significant changes in financial markets over the coming decades. Um, and what does climate change mean for investors? Climate change will uh, impact how the economy performs as a whole and the effects of climate change combined with government policies uh, could have significant impact on the investment, but also on lending portfolios. So um, stock picking is really not sufficient to manage these systemic risks and uh, taking climate change into account as a risk driver uh, in strategic investment decision making is, is crucial. So over a long time horizon, um, about more than 80% of returns and risks are the result of strategic asset allocation. And so when we talk about climate risk, we often differentiate between physical and transition risks. Um, physical risks are arising from the changing climate, um, so really the effects on um, physical assets and uh, the, the effects of extreme weather events, for example. On the other hand, transition risks are arising from the decarbonization, so from the actual transition to a low carbon economy, from technological advances, from government action to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. So both of these may affect the value of both assets and liabilities, as well as the future cost of insurance solutions. Physical risks uh, um, um, are really the impact of increased temperature and climate related extreme weather events increase in frequency and severity. And uh, plus there is a third component, which is the gradual slow onset impacts on sectors such as the agriculture or industrial and worker productivity. Um, according to our calculations on global level, it is the gradual physical risks that have the largest impact so far on the economy. Also, it's interesting to say that the uh, geographical location of countries also matters how they are affected. And uh, basically, clo uh, countries closer to the equator are more sensitive to gradual physical risks than northern countries. And also the starting temperature matters. So the sensitivity of different countries to extreme weather risks uh, also depends on their uh, size of the economy and on the location of large cities within the country. Uh, and then uh, I would like to say a few words about what we do and what is the approach that we take to quantify these risks. So basically in our methodology, we are assessing both these physical and transition risks. We produce uh, climate scenarios that are not forecasts in, in any way of what is going to happen. We are not uh, giving those prognoses, but rather explore risks in a range of future states of the world. So we look at the different actions taken to reduce emissions and the strength of response. We look at different transition pathways. We, we call them um, orderly and disorderly, depending on when actors start taking low carbon measures. So if we uh, assume that uh, already from next year, more action is going to be taken, then we can calculate with a more orderly transition, a smoother uh, transition. On the other hand, if you think it's not going to happen before 2025, then it's definitely a disorderly transition requiring stronger action in the later years of uh, this decade. Uh, we use a consistent set of transition scenarios for the comparability. Uh, we always do a Paris compliance scenario, so a scenario, a decarbonization scenario where we assume that the Paris target will be met. And we compare it with a failed transition scenario, which assumes that all the implemented and announced policies are taken into account, but nothing further is going to be done. Uh, by looking at these scenarios, we understand how the global economy is reacting. 
and we can explore how climate change related risks could affect uh, countries' economies, but also on specific portfolios. Then we compare these climate scenarios uh, to a climate uninformed scenario, which assumes no increase of physical risks and uh, doesn't have any, any assumptions about the transition to a low carbon economy. Um, these, these are our standard scenarios, but according to any client needs, we can uh, model bespoke scenarios as well. And um, just to say very briefly, not to go into the technical details of our model, it's a, it's a macroeconometric model. It's called E3ME. The three E's stand for uh, economy, energy and environment. And it's a demand driven, non optimizing uh, approach. We use macroeconometric equations to capture short term dynamics and long term trends. We model the various low carbon pathways. We introduce a series of specific policies that have been demonstrated to reduce emissions. And then um, running the model is actually an iterative process. And uh, then we look at how the policy ambition needs to be increased until a specified temperature target is met. And um, if you have any questions on either the scenarios or which are in line with the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial Sector's uh, requirements or our approach or any emerging results, then um, I'm happy to take um, any questions as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dora. Um, Talking about scenarios um, and moving on to the uh, investment side, to the investor's side. When you have a lot of scenarios, then you have a lot of uncertainties. Um, and I was just reading uh, an article uh, by Larry Fink, who is the chairman and CEO of BlackRock, where I learned that every year, as probably all of the CEOs write letters to uh, their clients and the respective subordinate CEOs, so the uh, uh, company CEOs, the sub, uh, subsidiary senior series, uh, CEOs. And this year, actually, he very much made it clear that basically BlackRock this year will put sustainability at the center of its investment strategy from now on going forward. So I think that's, uh, that's a very big undertaking. Um, and actually I'm turning now to Michael and asking him maybe to elaborate on this letter, what this means, what the strategy of BlackRock is, and how can you mitigate all these scenarios? And of course, what I also see and what I also read the sustainable investment definitely makes companies and eventually economies more resilient in the future. Michael? Perfect. Sultan, thanks a lot. It's quite a big ask that you have for the six, seven minutes that I've given as a speech time. Nevertheless, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, as I said in the introduction, my name is Michael Birch. I'm the country manager and head of Budapest for BlackRock in Hungary. Also, thanks a lot, Dora, for your introduction. I think the work you are doing uh, in, in the measurement, in coming up with ideas how to actually address, uh, particularly, I think, the environmental element is, is really important. It is something we, we closely monitor and we closely follow. Um, so I think it's very important that what you see and hear today is how also the things come together and how different companies, act, being experts in their fields, can actually work together to achieve the results and the targets that we have set ourselves. So for BlackRock and, and for my six to seven minutes, let me try to summarize it in three, three key parts that I wanna uh, talk to you today. So obviously a quick snapshot of what is happening now and what do we see every day? Um, why is sustainability such an important thing and why now? And obviously I think to, to Solon's point, I'm, how, how does BlackRock respond? Um, I think just to be mindful and, and what do we see now? BlackRock, we are a fiduciary to our client. That means um, the money that we manage and we look after is not our own money. It's actually the money of a lot of people around the world. People that are working, people that are retired, and we are taking the best care that we can to make sure we can help all our clients to experience financial being and to achieve their long-term financial goals. 
If you look back, um, I think for the last month, uh, obviously COVID has been at the top of everything. If you still go a bit back further into last September, I think we've seen millions of people taking the streets and talking about climate change and climate risk. And so I think the awareness of sustainability, in particular, I think of the E, the environmental part, um, has been rapidly changing and is also reshaping the financial industry as we speak now. Um, I think that's just something to be to be mindful of. What does it mean in the current environment? I think sustainability and climate um, elements need to be integrated into the portfolios and the way we run portfolios in order to achieve better risk adjusted returns for our investors. As said, Larry wrote his Rattler, which is, I think, a really important one, particularly given we are the largest asset manager in the world that manages more than 7 trillion US dollars of assets. Again, all on behalf of our clients and not for ourselves. So in that letter, Larry made a few commitments and I will come back to those in the end. Uh, again, being the largest asset manager, the industry, the clients, uh, everyone looks at us and obviously wants to see and wants to hear how we react and whether we take it seriously. So for us, sustainability is becoming an integral part of portfolio construction and of risk management. Uh, our ambition by the end of the, of the year is to have ESG integrated alongside all of our portfolios. But also we want to exit investments that present the high sustain sustainability rated risk. Again, think of thermal coal being one example. So we are in the process of screening all those investments and finding ways how we can exit them. At the same time, we also see our obligation to launch new investment products that, for example, screen fossil fuels uh, and make sure that we are no longer investing in those. And then finally, I think it's also as a firm, we want to strengthen our commitment to sustainability and transparency, which goes further than just the environmental element, but actually also the social and the governmental element. I think all of that together hopefully should f serve the purpose uh, to achieve long-term profit profitability whilst I think ensuring sustainability as well. I think it's something investors and companies can no longer ignore. Uh, we've heard about uh, the cost of reinsurance, the cost of lending, and I think it ultimately will end up in higher costs of capital, particularly for those companies that are struggling in, in compi complying with uh, the sustainability requirements. So in a nutshell, why, and I'm coming to the second point, why to go sustainable now? I think if we look back on the last couple of months and what has been happening uh, also with COVID and um, the market volatility in COVID, I think we've seen that um, ESG has revealed uh, risks during this crisis that most financial systems could not factor in on the one hand. On the other hand, um, sustainable companies, uh, and uh, there is evidence um, in the market, sustainable companies actually have uh, weathered the downturn better than non-sustainable companies. And we believe they will also recover faster uh, due to the resiliency of their operational procedures, but also I think the way um, they work in with their employees and the morale. So again, coming back to the kind of social and the governance element as well. I think at the same time, unsustainable business models are riskier. We see an increased scrutiny um, from the public, from the markets, from the investors. So companies clearly understood that they need to act and they need to change. Obviously, business models cannot change from one day to the other. Uh, and let's be honest, uh, even if you've been relying on fossil fuels, this will take quite some time to come up with alternative solutions that are much more sustainable. But on the other hand, I think we also see changes in the policy and regulation. I mean, the EU um, uh, is pressing on the Green Deal, carbon neutrality by 2050 um, enshrined in law. Individual countries like France have already pressed forward and are putting a lot of pressure on, on the companies in order to achieve their sustainability goals. And last but not least, and I mentioned that in the beginning, also our clients, people that uh, are protesting in the streets, the younger generation that is putting a lot of focus on the long-term sustainability of the planet and the climate we are living in, is putting a lot of pressure and is demanding the industry and particularly um, the investors to act and to make sure that uh, we behave in a, in, a, in a way that in the long term will lead to a better world and I think to a more sustainable outcome. 
What does it mean for us as BlackRock? Um, I think in a nutshell, as said, we our aim is to have a 100% ESG integration by the end of 2020, so that all of our funds, all of our more than 7 trillion assets uh, are fully integrated uh, into the ESG terms. As some of you know, probably Aladdin, which is our core risk engine, which we use for ourselves, but also use uh, or offer to our clients, uh, will be um, Aladdinized uh, into sustainable investing. So to deliver the data, the analytics, the technology to actually support clients in their shift into the sustainable investing. And we also committed ourselves uh, to get up to 1 trillion of assets being dedicated purely to sustainable assets. So obviously, again, this is not a journey that can happen from one day to the other. That's actually a journey that will take some time. So as said, um, for us, uh, the key focus is the investment integration, so, so integrating the sustainability-related insights and the data into BlackRock's investment processes across all asset classes and across all investment styles. It's delivering sustainable investment products and solutions that help our clients to achieve their financial objectives. But we also want to help on the research and insight side, developing the clearest possible picture of how environmental, social and governance issues affect risk and long-term return. And then finally, data and analytics, developing a leading financial technology platform for sustainable investing. Because again, I think only if we have common definitions, common targets and data that we can rely on, it will help us to, to invest sustainably. So that's, I think, one of the three pillars. The other one is the investment stewardship topic. Um, as you know, being an investor in most of the stock listed companies, it also comes with a certain responsibility. So we continue, and this is a, a element in the firm that is completely separated from the investment side. We continue to engage with the companies uh, on a daily basis um, that we are invested in. Uh, we want to understand what is their strategy, what are their long term goals, how do they deal with sustainability to make sure we get an understanding how this impacts the long term performance. And obviously, finally, being a stock listed company ourselves, we are also very keen to make sure we act in a sustainable way ourselves. So the way we look at our employees, we develop our employees, we support our employees is a key element to become a sustainable company on our own. Because what we ask from our companies that we invest in, obviously, we also need to lead by example. So as a next step, I think for us, and this was very clear in BlackRock's letter, ESG is the default. Um, and um, we are well on track to have all of our portfolios being fully ESG screened. Uh, I think the crisis that we're seeing right now with COVID is actually only accelerating the shift to sustainable investing. Um, stakeholderism is becoming central. So it's it started on the E side. I think at some point it will turn into the ESG, will turn into GSE, so the governments and the social elements which are equally important to the environmental ones. I think the environmental ones are, as I said, the more most pronounced ones. And obviously, we believe that business models will not, uh, not all survive. And I think ESG is going to be a great tool to help the firms navigate better. With that, I hope I was able to give you an insight how we deal uh, with ESG as an investor and being the largest investor in the world. And thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, very comprehensive and I would say very, very credible um, because this is the way forward. Um, now, if we look at uh, investment from another angle, uh, the Blue Planet Climate Protection Foundation, I would say, is a very unique initiative, maybe even international, but definitely in Hungary. Um, basically, with its goal to become a partner, a supporter and organizer in initiative focusing primarily on sustainability priorities. And at the same time, the foundation has just uh, set up a venture capital fund, basically to uh, have the financial resources available and to be allocated to these types of uh, uh, investments and I'm asking Nandor now to elaborate a bit more on the past three years and maybe the next years the next year's plans of the of the foundation Nandor the floor is yours 
Thank you. Thank you, George, for having me and uh, our foundation here today. We are in a very interesting position because we basically are between public and uh, private sectors. Our founder, as you mentioned, Mr. Janos Schader, the president of Hungary, founded this foundation almost three years ago in order to help to find ways to do our homework for more sustainable world as a person and um, as a profit or non-profit organizations. He has organized uh, three water summits here in Budapest to show how many products and um, services that could help to solve the water crisis um, in the world. In um, 2019, we turned our foundation towards sustainable projects. If you look for us, uh, you will find um, many initiatives that help in a number of ways for sustainability to become much more understandable. But at the end of the day, we recognize all of us uh, know well what the problem is. And uh, we, we are facing, but we have no answers to questions, who will pay the bill? I think that's the main question in uh, front of uh, all um, governments and um, business entities who want to solve this, uh, this question. So last uh, year we thought a big and um, started to build up a finance solution to this question. Our point of view was that the problem is how we look the potential, uh, potential projects. The business sector and uh, the public too, we invest money and wait for uh, a return in a short or longer term, look at only a few things and uh, not the whole picture. The main question, are we counting all the cost? Uh, the answer is no. We are counting the cost that we have to pay, for example, for an industrial investment, but nobody counts how much money the healthcare budget has to pay in the long term to handle the consequences related to these investments too. So if we need a real change, first we need new rules and uh, new formulas. And who could be the first and who has to be, uh, who has to be the first in this line? Of course, uh, those who have deeper responsibilities, the states, uh, because they have to work in balance, but their major goal is to serve the public good. And because we are in the middle somewhere between the public and the private sectors, and our main, our main target is uh, to find the solution to how we can design the new investment formula. So our investments fund is like a pilot project, uh, for that idea, and I hope I can change the rule of, or we can change the rule of the game. And uh, what it means in practically. Uh, classic venture capitals, investments uh, seeks double yield compared to the interest rates of the banks who finance the, the projects. We do not uh, follow this way. We are good if uh, we know and get the proof of how uh, the projects can stay in line, uh, make reduced profits for the owners and finance future innovation. So uh, our goal uh, for a long term is to show for investors and the government who spend a lot of money to restart the economy after COVID-19. Um, you can do it in a, in a different way, but you have to open your scale much, uh, much more than, than look only the few or the main point, how much profit you can uh, earn back in the short term. Thank you, George. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, this is a unique initiative and I would uh, very much wish that this could be a long-term success, which would actually uh, be replicated in, in many more uh, uh, countries of the world. Um, now, I'm turning to the private sector. This is the third part of our discussion, because without the private sectors and the corporate world's involvement, uh, it's impossible to tackle the, 
climate change because hundreds of millions of billion billions of euros or dollars are needed to make the transition into a sustainable economy uh, the the paris targets were refer referred to the climate neutrality numbers were referred to so this is a big big bulk of investment that is needed and this cannot be raised by public funding by any means and we have here three companies i think which are exemplary in what they have been doing up to now and what vision they have uh, towards reaching all these goals and i would uh, start off with uh, syngenta um, i did some digging and i found that syngenta is has just recently announced a year ago to invest two billion dollars in the next five years to help farmers prepare for and tackle climate change the end goal of this could be would be to reduce agriculture's uh, contribution to climate change harness it, is uh, uh, its mitigation capacity I mean, $2 billion is, is by no means a small amount of money. Uh, and I'm turning now to, to Ada, who is um, heading the business sustainability at Syngenta, um, to elaborate a bit more, not only on the $2 billion, but on what Syngenta is, is doing in this field and what your vision as a company is. Thank you very much, Scholt, um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about Syngenta's plans here. As you said, uh, we are an agricultural company, which really means that we are engaged in two separate areas of, uh, of the business, working together with farmers, and one is plant protection and the other one is uh, seeds, uh, so the seeds for the crops that farmers grow. So uh, whenever we think about sustainability, we also think about our customers and there is uh, the, the only way we can really make a change is together with our farmers. So when we, th we thought about our next five year sustainability plan, which is called the Good Growth Plan, first we talked to farmers and we, we uh, informed our Good Growth Plan with data from what they have to say, uh, how they perceive that climate change has actually uh, impacted their business and how what are the risks that they see so the uh, the research tells us that um, that um, um, 59 percent of farmers worldwide see say that already that they think that their businesses have already been affected uh, by climate change and of course this is the most intense in India and Africa as Dora also said that the closer to the equation you are the, the equator you are the more uh, you experience this 72 percent of the farmers worldwide also say that they are concerned about um, uh, about uh, the serious effects that they expect climate change to have on their farms profitability in the next over the next five years and they also believe that reducing the green, greenhouse gas emissions would make their farms uh, financially um, more stable and more competitive. Uh, just for uh, the, the uh, data sake, um, I'd like to say that the, uh, agriculture's contribution to the total greenhouse gas emissions worldwide is 12%, and most of that actually comes from, uh, from animal husbandry. So uh, this is what our farmer, farmers tell us. And of course, uh, we have informed our good growth plan with this data in mind. And we said we, our goal is to help, um, help farmers and help uh, them mitigate uh, the effects of climate change on farm. Um, OK, so uh, how do we do this? Um, uh, well, uh, first of all, um, the good growth plan itself, let, let me uh, say a few words about how we understand good growth. That's why it is called good growth, because actually the, the way we look at this is that economy is embedded in society and the society and the economy work within the planetary boundaries. Uh, so we have a finite world with finite resources, which also means that we need to be able to grow the business and grow farmers' business within these planetary boundaries and within these finite resources. 
So um, that's 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 the way we are thinking about um, reshaping our business model going forward uh, and informing our business model changes also and our strategies going forward with sustainability at the heart of everything we do. Um, as you mentioned, Roald, uh, we did uh, commit last year in October uh, to uh, invest $2 billion over five years uh, in sustainable agriculture. And, the, and we also said that we will accelerate this in the innovation for farmers and nature. So it's not just the money that we are putting in there, but we also see that there is an urgency here uh, to, make, to, in, to make these investments um, effectively and quickly coming into the market. So we also said that part of the $2 billion uh, investment over the next five years in agricultural breakthroughs, we will, we will bring at least two of these breakthroughs to the market um, every year. So that's about the pace of the innovation. We, we believe that uh, innovation, uh, farmers and the nature guided innovation is the future for sustainable agriculture and speed uh, plays a key role there. Um, we will also strive for the lowest residues in crops and the environment, so we will make sure that farmers have the technologies to, uh, to, to best um, maintain their crops going forward as far as, as we can, help them uh, to mitigate uh, that risk and to lower the residues in crops and the environment. Um, again, of course, we have our own operations as well, and we have heard from BlackRock there uh, that they are also um, uh, looking at how, what they do. So we decided that we will reduce our own carbon intensity in our operations uh, by 50% by 2030. Uh, so that's something that's uh, 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 totally in our control and that we are committed to do. Um, uh, what we can do in terms of uh, striving for a carbon neutral agriculture with farmers is to um, find a method to measure and enable carbon capture and mitigation in uh, agriculture. Because um, uh, contrary to many other industries, agriculture actually is on both parts of the equation. On the one hand, there is carbon emissions and there is a contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, but at the, on the other hand, also, um, agriculture and plants um, and soil is able to capture and uh, sequester carbon. So that's something we are also working uh, together with our farmers, how we can do that and how we can consciously make that part of the profitability equation on farm. Um, we are also committed to enhance biodiversity on uh, um, in agriculture, which is very, very important for the food safety and the uh, food chain security uh, going forward. And of course, last but way not least is the goal zero incidents in our operations. And we would like to also make sure that we train people who use our products for the safe usage of, of those products. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we strive for, for fair labor across the entire supply chain. So uh, this is it uh, in a nutshell in terms of um, our sustainability strategy. So if there is one thing that I would ask you to take with you is, uh, is that that set of words good growth so grow in a good way within a society societal and uh, planetary boundaries thank you very much and very much um, interested in in the other two companies and happy to answer any questions anyone may have either in the chat or live thank you very much uh, ida um very much appreciated your last words i mean they sound to be very forward-looking, not only credible. Um, and yes, the next company moving forward uh, is Nestle. I don't think we need to introduce Nestle to anybody. Uh, worldwide uh, coverage in um, FMCG. And Nestle, to me, is very prone to risks, such as negative impact of climate change, particularly its impact on raw material quality and availability. And of course, uh, Nestle is also very close to agriculture, per definition. Um, and I introduced uh, Peter as uh, CEO of the Hungarian subsidiary, but uh, maybe some advertisement for you. I mean, it's I think you are almost 30 years with Nestle, going around the world from New Zealand, Australia to Switzerland. So you have probably have a very holistic view of your company and of course on um, on, on sustainability. Um, 
I just wanted to say this because um, I think uh, when I said this panel is uh, um, is a very robust one, uh, or the the participants have a beyond Hungary a vast experience. Of course, I did not mention anybody, but I think the three decades says it all. So, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, George. Can you hear me? Okay, because I was, I was obviously muted. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, indeed, uh, 29 years and nine months. Uh, I am celebrating soon 30 years with Nestle and uh, three continents, six countries, 11 different positions. So, and I was in Asia as well in the Philippines for six years. So I think I have seen quite a lot of uh, different aspects of sustainability. But let me first say that it's great to be in this panel because uh, I always like to talk about ecosystem in sustainability, in which ecosystem we should have always every single stakeholder and player playing uh, their or its role. And in this panel, we have uh, several players. Probably uh, uh, one missing is, uh, is the authorities uh, and the other one is the consumer. Uh, all the others are more or less in this panel. And uh, if we start with BlackRock, uh, obviously it was uh, interesting to listen to Michael. Uh, BlackRock is one of the biggest investors in Nestle. And uh, what you have heard from him is very clear that if we are not following the rules, <clears throat> the SDGs, the ESG principles, BlackRock is not going to invest in Nestle. So it's, it wouldn't be very good to lose uh, one of our biggest investors. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in terms of agriculture, yes, extremely important. We have a lot of materials uh, coming from agriculture. We are the biggest uh, FMCG company in the world, 300 billion um, capitalization or market cap. Uh, so it is indeed uh, very important. And uh, one of the aspects in our uh, uh, circular economy approach is how to create a more regenerative agriculture. That is how to start with. Uh, another important uh, aspect, uh, I think, is also uh, the measurement. Uh, so we have heard about Cambridge. Uh, that is actually one uh, of the things what we are trying to, to work on with Nestle or within Nestle as well. Uh, we are trying to uh, comply with the current existing numerous um, measurement systems. Uh, and this is probably one element which uh, I'm trying to work also on this uh, and uh, trying to, to push for a more standardized approach across the world, uh, obviously from uh, my very small part of the world. But uh, I think it would be very important and it would help everyone, investors, consumers, companies, corporations, and uh, all the authorities as well, even NGOs, uh, to have a common measurement system, which would help us to comply better. But if I go back to... The details of Nestle, I think uh, we, here we talk about sustainable investment, uh, but I think uh, we have two aspects of that. One is how to finance it, and uh, the other one is uh, how to make sure that uh, the, the investment sustainability can stay and how we can create this circular economy. And um, one of the points which is always uh, raised is uh, plastics. And I wanted to allude to plastics a little bit more in detail because uh, this year we announced, uh, interestingly, also two billion, a little bit more than two billion dollars, two billion Swiss francs investment only in packaging, uh, because uh, one of the biggest issues, obviously, is is plastic. And uh, one aspect which we should bear in mind, and uh, one of the reasons I mentioned the Philippines, when we are in Europe, in a climate like ours, uh, we are somewhat luckier than some other parts of the world because uh, in terms of uh, sustaining the quality of the, the food products is relatively easier than in tropical climates. So when uh, some people say it would be easy to stop uh, plastic packaging from one day to another, this is not as simple as that. And we have heard also today about fossil fuels uh, from Michael that it is not going to be possible to eliminate them uh, from one day to the other. Uh, of course, we need to work on it. You remember and you know all the reduce, reduce, recycle, 
principles reduce yes but immediately stop it would be it would have very harmful uh, impact on some parts of the world but what we did uh, with this 2 billion investment uh, uh, we would like to uh, move from virgin plastics to food grade recycled plastics as soon as possible and we are also trying to develop innovative sustainable packaging solutions uh, so our commitment in 2018, what we made was to make our 100% of our packaging uh, recyclable or reusable by 2025. And we are very much on track with that. Uh, but we also would like to reduce the virgin plastics by one third uh, in the same period. And now uh, what we decided is to invest in a market or create a market, uh, investing 1.5 billion out of this 2 billion for plastics which are not easy to recycle. It's actually not worth it. There are very few companies who are capable of recycling these plastics and even less who want to do it because financially it doesn't make sense uh, for them. So what we decided is to invest one and a half billion Swiss uh, to pay a premium for these materials between now and 2025. And uh, obviously, uh, just to uh, also comfort a little bit uh, BlackRock when they invest in Nestle, we are not going to spend this money just to reduce the profitability. We are going to uh, improve our efficiencies to compensate for all this. And I think for companies which are traded on the stock exchange and for their investors, it's very important that even if these impacts or initiatives cost at the beginning, it cannot be at the detriment of the profitability. Uh, another important part is that we launched uh, a 250 million uh, Swiss franc uh, venture fund uh, where we are going to work on sustainable packaging uh, in, with startup companies and with large uh, packaging companies as well that focus on these areas. So uh, we believe that with uh, these two initiatives, in addition to our continued uh, efforts in uh, research, sourcing and manufacturing, uh, we are going to be able to uh, reach our uh, net greenhouse, zero net greenhouse gas emission uh, commitment by 2050. Uh, and lastly, I also wanted to mention that uh, we also created an institute uh, for packaging sciences. That's the remaining part of the 2 billion Swiss francs. Uh, this is in Switzerland and uh, we are housing or hosting, accommodating uh, startups uh, and researchers to be able to uh, to come up with ideas that can faster uh, or accelerate uh, the the direction we want to take to take with the plastic uh, commitment what Nestle has made. Thank you Thank very you. much, Peter. Um, and last but not least, uh, I will be moving on. Mm. Peter, but another Peter. He is representing Philip Morris uh, International. Uh, Philip Morris, traditionally known as Big Tobacco, the world reader cigarette company. Um, and it's a company which uh, actually in 2016 announces or announced its new purpose to deliver a smoke free future and less harmful smoking to those who choose to smoke uh, or to continue smoking. Um, so this is a very big undertaking. I mean, usually these big transitions are coming from startup companies, not the, the big ones, as I said, big tobacco. So it's, it's very interesting maybe to hear uh, your insights on, on how this transformation can happen and how this actually coincides or supports sustainability per se. Yes, thank you so much, George, uh, for, for these uh, words. Exactly, that's the situation that uh, I'm representing a tobacco company dedicated to a smoke-free future. So this seems to be a good contradiction for the first side. But uh, as we know, it's, it's not a contradiction, it's innovation. It's an innovation uh, which is incorporating uh, ECG criteria and, and sustainability approach, in fact. Uh, it is not only a change uh, that uh, we are ongoing, even uh, this year, 
uh, in 2020 when the whole world is changing and hopefully changing to a more sustainable uh, future. Hopefully we will not come back uh, to the same situation that we left uh, behind in March. Uh, but it is with the same understanding the whole transformation uh, of the company, the transformation uh, with the uh, with the sustainability approach uh, undertaking all the measures uh, that are implemented. So what it is all about? It is about uh, realizing and knowing uh, that uh, smoking, as uh, we have experienced it in the past decades, is harmful, that it represents significant burden for healthcare and also for the environment as it is. So what can we do? We know the problem. What are the tools uh, that can be efficient? Of course, uh, the problem, uh, the tool for the, so, uh, solving the problem is to stop or to reduce. We le learned uh, before in the speeches, uh, as uh, Peter said from Nestle, that reuse and recycle in the tobacco industry, it's stop or reduce. And uh, the best thing that one can do is not to st uh, start smoking, and the second best thing, if he's smoking, uh, then he has to stop it, if he can. And it's a good thing that uh, representing a tobacco company, I say that uh, in a conference, it was not always the case. Uh, but that's only one part of the picture, uh, because according to scientific research, we know that it's 5% of the smokers uh, who can uh, quit. And it's only 8% of the smokers who can quit uh, with support, with medical support, uh, with, uh, with support of medicines or therapies. So we have an approach, uh, a tool for solving this problem, but uh, this tool is also efficient for 8% of those who are affected. So what should we do? We should sit back and wait. No, we should innovate. We should take care of the other 92% of those who cannot quit, but who would like to reduce the harm uh, that they experience uh, uh, on a daily basis. And it's not only for them, for our consumers, but it's also for those uh, who are experienced smoking as non-smokers. We have to protect them as well. So is there anything that can be the benefit for the smoker and for the non-smoker as well? Yes, there is. It's innovation on a sustainable basis. We need to reduce the harm, uh, the, uh, those chemicals uh, that are affecting the body of those people who are smoking and who are experiencing smokers. And how we can do that? Uh, we do it with research. And it's very unique that a tobacco company, a traditional tobacco company, uh, have started to do uh, clinical research, uh, which we experienced uh, from pharma companies only earlier. We do clinical research uh, based on good clinical practices uh, criteria. Uh, we spent uh, more than 7 billion US dollars on clinical research in the past years. And in fact, uh, it has significant results. Even this year, the FDA, uh, the US Health Agency has uh, accepted and declared uh, that these solutions, uh, these achievements, these technologies can have positive effect on public health, on the whole society. So this is the approach uh, that can meet that medical and public need that is still there. Uh, is it a unique one? Uh, is it something that is uh, introduced by the tobacco industry? No, it is not. Uh, this is the sustainability approach that we are experiencing at all uh, levels of the life uh, in, on our daily basis. We know that uh, cars are uh, harmful, uh, they are not uh, environmentally friendly. So what should we do? We shouldn't use cars at all. We shouldn't use public transportation at all. We shouldn't go by airplane. But we know that's not really possible. We cannot walk so much. Uh, we cannot use the bicycle so much. So what are we doing? We are choosing something in between, which is reducing harm, less like public transportation or electric cars, or things like that. And it's exactly the same thing uh, nowadays uh, when we have autumn, 
and we are experiencing that there is smoke coming out of the uh, chimneys uh, and the, the heating systems are on. And we know that the smoke that is coming out of the chimneys has the same negative effect that the smoke that is coming out of uh, conventional cigarettes. But we know that we can do something against. Of course, we have to heat our homes uh, during winter time, but we can choose those alternatives that are less harmful, that are uh, protecting the environment. Those technologies, public heatings and others like that, which are somewhere in between. So it's exactly the same approach. It is harm reduction, harm reduction at the field of healthcare, and harm reduction at the field of environment protection. Because these novel tobacco technologies are also uh, better uh, alternative choices when it comes to environment protection. For example, uh, for Philip Morris, we have our uh, recycling plant, our global recycling headquarter located in Hungary because the devices are completely recyclable. And also those uh, that are used uh, in these devices, uh, those are also the consumables uh, can be uh, uh, reused as well, uh, not as much affecting the planet as those ones uh, that were representing the conventional cigarettes. So there is a step ahead. We know the problem and we have to choose new tools new tools, not the ones only that we have used before, but those ones uh, that allows us to use based on innovation, based on science, and based on evidences. So fight is not anymore the solution, the efficient solution for this problem. It is cooperation and innovation uh, that is the solution that can let us to, to go far behind, be, uh, in front of uh, those achievements that uh, we could already achieve and to get a better solution for the problem that we have. And it is not only for the benefit of smokers, but for the protection of the non-smokers, of the passive smokers as well. So basically for the whole society. So let's do it together. I would propose that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh... Peter, um, I'm just looking at the clock and uh, the one hour just flew by, so we still have two minutes left. Um, unfortunately, um, we would need probably more hours because if you ask me, I would have listened to you even longer because uh, if I would summarize the past uh, almost 60 minutes, uh, I would call it informative, inspiring, and forward-looking. Um, and I really hope that uh, the audience or viewers also share this with me because, uh, as I said, uh, this panel uh, has such a big uh, view, uh, such a broad view, and a big experience on sustainability and sustainable investment per se, that next time i hope that we can have even a longer discussion um the questions were also answered thank you very much to uh, uh to the panelists um and i would like to thank the panelists again because uh, you also have contributed and you also have done i think a very thorough preparation because um, i have given you the six seven minutes which is i know it's a it's very difficult but it's even more difficult to do it online um, and hope next year we could do it um, in person and in person with USCSR Europe. Thank you very much.